Hi, I'm Heather Hubbard. I went from being a lawyer and partner at one of the largest firms in America to becoming an online personality and successful entrepreneur. I know what it takes to rise to the top. I also know all too well the toll it can take on your health and personal life. So how do you shine bright without burning out? How do you chase joy while achieving success? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow podcast. Welcome back to Hustle and Flow. I am your host, Heather Hubbard, and we are on episode 195. And if you have been a fan of Hustle and Flow or me for any time at all, our next guest needs no introduction. But if you are new around here, I want to introduce you to Mike Ganino. He is the guy that professional speakers, authors, and coaches call when they want to stop winging it on stage, and they are ready to start giving transformational speeches. His clients call him a keynote director. I call him when I want to gossip about Taylor Swift, wine, or bougie travel, or thank him for gifts. This lovely cup, this wine cup is from (laughs) Mike. So welcome back, Mike Ganino. Thank you so much. You know, I always think whenever I'm going to buy myself a a bougie drinking vessel that's Taylor Swift themed that I need to do it for someone else. And then I feel less guilty about doing it for myself. So thank you for helping me. Look, you have sent me so many good gifts over the years, and I am a terrible (laughs) gift giver, mainly in that I just don't give gifts. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Um, that happens. Yeah, it has nothing to do with my love. I try to show it, I think, in other ways. But you were a fabulous gift giver, and I am happy to be your friend and a recipient of those fabulous gifts. Well, you know what I love about you is when we're together, you always buy my wine. So that's all I need anyway. So perfect gift for me is food and wine. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So you were on in December of 2019. And so for those of you who have not listened, or it's been a while, go back and listen. It's really, really good. It's all about being more persuasive with storytelling. And that is episode 143. And so then fast forward, maybe five, six months. Obviously, we had no idea what was coming in 2024, (laughs) right? I call you and I'm like, Mike, I have this idea and it's kind of wild and it's kind of big, But would you do it with me? And it was summer camp. And I wanted you to be the MC, and you were all in. Like, you didn't even hesitate. You were like, let's do this. And then you hosted After Party. You were the MC on that. And so I think a lot of people listening probably met you that way. And let's show a little bit of video for those who just want to recap or aren't sure what we're talking about. Here we are. I'm so excited that summer camp is here. I have been waiting for this, begging for this, because I needed this. Did you need this? I want to see you guys. And I want to see you dancing. Come on. You cannot replicate an in-person experience virtually. You can't. So let's not try to claim that we can, but we can make the best of the situation. And I think that we can actually have an amazing program that we wouldn't be able to have otherwise. And quite frankly, there are things in our world that are broken. And so our personal transformations can contribute to a more aware and more conscious society. When we are actually vulnerable, we are able to be courageous. And the path to being courageous, the path to being bold requires vulnerability. To look at the new moon phase, that's when you're going to plant seeds, have intentions, um, new ideas, new um, goals develop. I'm not at Miraval, so I need to have like a little moment. So I got my my little match. I got my little Palo Santo, okay? I'm going to get some vibes. I'm going to get my vibes going over here. You know, I want to begin by just stating how important it is for us to be together in this time. In a time where it's about being physically distanced, it's really important that we stay emotionally connected. Today is the day I do something different. Today is the day I see that I am worth more than trying to be a shadow of someone else. I am worth being my whole self. Hit the chat and let me know a takeaway that you had from your group huddle, from your cabin 
huddle, what were some of the takeaways? What intention did you set for yourself today? You need to find your community. Look around you. And by look around, I mean virtually. Scroll through your Zoom right now and look at the faces of these women, these like-minded women, maybe women on the precipice of a huge change who are just like you. What I want you to take away from what I'm teaching you is a framework to actually make it stick. Play full out. If you will play full out, you are gonna have some amazing, amazing experiences. For today, even if it's just one day, unplug, laugh, play, scream, whatever you want. Just be creative. Oh my gosh, that was so good, right? <laughs> it ah. also feels like, like that was me pre-child. That was me uh, drinking wine every night because of COVID. Uh, it's just so funny to think of like those, uh, that time, but also that space was so special that like environment was so great. Uh, everyone, I don't know. It was a good time. It was a wonderful time. And you know, that was about the time I was actually getting sick, but had I not had summer camp, like, I don't know what would have gotten me through that summer. It was just a blast. And I have to say, you stole the show like you were the highlight <laughs> of summer camp and you just you've always been such an entertainer and you just bring a smile to everyone's faces um and part of what i want to talk about today you actually were one of the advisors and coaches as part of my 2020 mastermind experience and so some of the people who did campfire talks you coached them and it was clear <laughs> that you coached them. Their, their talks were phenomenal, you know? Mm. And so if it's okay with you, I would love to talk about one, for those who are listening, who are speakers, um, how they can up their game. But for those who don't see themselves as speakers, but they're business owners, they're leaders, so they have to speak, um, how they can improve their speaking skills as well. Mm. Is that yeah. cool? Can, can we get into both? I love it. I love it. Okay. We could do it all. Okay, let's do it all. Let's start with the speakers. All okay. right. You coach a lot of people, biggest stages. What is the difference between what makes someone good, great, and legendary? Mm. I think that it ultimately comes down to a sliding scale of their ability to the range of choices that are available to them up there. And then I think that's kind of a, it's a, it's true. And it's like a cop out answer because that could be, because part of what, part of what messes people up, part of what loses us from being present in the moment with audiences is overthinking, being worried, being worried about what do I do if, or will I remember, or will this happen or that happen? And so when we have a bunch of choices available to us, then that is less of an issue. We could be more present because whatever happens, you're going to have a very great elevated way to solve it. And so I think a lot of times with speakers where we see them being boring or being um, pacing, doing, doing distracting things, it's just because it's not that they're making bad choices. It's that they didn't even realize there were other choices they could be making. So mm -hmm. they tell a story because someone told them, tell a story. All good stories have beginning, middles, and ends. So then we hear like, 15 minutes of backstory that aren't useful or helpful and nothing happens. We see them completely disconnected from their body because they've been told, uh, here's what you do with gestures. Here's what you do, or you need to go visit all the different sides of the audience so they could feel you and see you. And it just looks like it's not even pacing. Like, you know, there's pacing where it's like, oh, that person is really feeling nervous. It's wandering. People mm. wander. I'm going to wander over here to the left and talk to them. I'm going to wander over here to the right and talk to them. And it just, it has no power to it. So I think mm -hmm. that the good to great to legendary is the amount of available choices they have to them, which is through working, which is through workshopping it, which is through having a director say, hey, what about this? Or have you ever tried this? Or, oh, how could you go here or there? And then within that, what are the specific choices they would be making that would make it better? One is 
not just like you should tell a story. I think at the uh, we've heard enough of that at this point. And the neuroscience of storytelling and mirror neurons, we've heard so much of this. We get it. Now we have all these people trying to tell stories and they don't know where to start. They don't know how to make it engaging. They don't know where to take the story. And so I'll say there, what people know to do is to, it's a Kurt Vonnegut thing. This comes from Kurt Vonnegut, my favorite writer, who start the story as close to the action as possible. Like I was just working with someone this morning and I, she had probably like eight minutes of helping us understand this dude. And I was like, what if you just started when a thing happened like close to the action of something happening. And then you could say, oh, and by the way, he probably felt that way because for 20 years, he's been working over here. Oh, that's all we need to know. We didn't need to hear for 20 years he did this and then he did this and then he did that. Um, in the case of someone telling a story of, you know, something that happened on a vacation, this was someone else I worked with this week. They started with a lot of backstory about at home, they were packing the anxiety they felt and what was going on and the kid, and then they sat in the car and then they got to the airport or they're sitting in the airport and then they got on the plane and it's like, it's a lot of places where nothing happens. You just sit versus what if it was like when you unlocked the hotel room and you realize you forgot your child's favorite, you know, sleepy, sleepy friend. And then you could give us backstory. And for the last three weeks, I've been so anxious, packing my list, putting it together, all of these things start further into the action is the big thing I see physicality. People forget they have bodies. <laughs> <laughs> that's the big thing that's good to great to legendary is you have a body. You can move it. You can move it vertically. You can move it horizontally. How could you get your body more involved? Those are the choices. And then vocally, you can make things funny, emotional, powerful, fun, thoughtful, just by the way you change your voice. So I think that's good to great to legendary. Those are the choices I see people make. And far too many people get obsessed with the words they wrote down on the piece of paper to memorize their script. And they forget that we show up to see a human being deliver it. Right. Not a robot. You know, it's funny, though, you're like, we've all heard about stories. And yet you would think that. But in some industries, and this is probably going to go a little bit more to our entrepreneurs, but like we've all been to the conferences or whatever else where like literally people still don't even know that you need to be telling stories. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> we're not just here for information. There is so much noise and we all are so distracted by so many things that you have to hook people. You have to really grab their attention. And that's what I hear you saying with like, start with some action. It reminds me, I don't know if you actually remember this because now I'm going, I'm, I'm reliving summer camp still. Um, <laughs> it made me think of Vaughn Jacobs. Do you remember her story? And I know I'm putting you on the spot where that was one of the things you had her do. She was telling the story from the beginning and you said, no, let's start it from the the hype. Yeah. Um, and it just changed everything because like she spoke that first sentence and we were all like, what is coming next? It's, it's, and that's exactly the moment we want. We want people to say, oh, where's this gonna go? How is she gonna get out of it? You don't want them saying, where is this going? You don't want them saying that. <laughs> <laughs> which is what they say when they get a lot of backstory of like, what is the point of this dude's career yeah. history? What you want them to say is like, where is, how is she going to get out of this? What, how did she get there? Like that's cinematic. That's Hollywood. That's what happens. You know, you see a play open. They don't come out and say the play like, Hey, how's everyone feeling? Yeah. Have you ever thought about history and how it's so, it no, Hamilton comes out and the scene begins and you say, well, how the heck, what's going to happen next? That's what we want in those moments. And so, yeah, I do remember, uh, that I remember mostly because I could be conflating with anyone because it's almost always the same thing I say to everybody is we have to start <laughs> that story way further into it than where we started. And then if we realize that we're lost, great, then take a break and say, oh, you're probably wondering, how did I end up here? Well, five years ago, my dad said this to me. Cool. That's all we needed. But starting yeah. five years ago, it's like, that's a lot of nothing happening. I mean, I know we're talking about stages. But honestly, so I think part of this is where, as you know, the, the past year I've been playing with stand-up comedy and it's been <laughs> so much fun. But one of the things that we are taught is that because you generally only get so much time and a lot of times when you're beginning, it's a really short amount of time. So how do you tell four minutes worth of jokes that are really funny where there's not just one punchline? And it's all about the real estate. You only have so many words. You only have so much time. So there is so much. You just go back and back and back and you cut and cut and cut. And you say, how do I say this shorter? How, right? Like, how do I take this? And, and the thing is, every time I'm always like, this is totally not possible. And 
it generally is and mm. it's it's generally a much better story <laughs> because we remove the filler yeah it's it's all of the the thing with speaking uh that's that's just like comedy is that we we have to get the which is one of the things I love is we have to get the audience's brain their their brain should be doing the work of creating images and so when we watch a movie, we could be a little a little more passive, right? We could just sit back and watch the movie. We watch a play. Oh, let them let me see what they created here. But when you're telling a story, you want the audience to be imagining it. Now, this is where people can go off track here, where there ends up a lot of information that they don't need of like, oh, they need to be able to see the room. Well, maybe if the room's important, but if you want them to see their childhood room, then don't describe yours in so much detail. So a lot of the cutting sometimes when I'm working with someone in that case is Oh, what we could cut is all the stuff that is not helping them get an image, not helping them put it somewhere. So a lot of times that's a lot of backstory. That's a lot of description or it's messy description. For example, if they're describing a person, they could say, ah, my friend Heather, um, she is a gorgeous woman. She is so pretty. She's got the most gorgeous uh, ivory color, not ivory colored hair. Uh, what is the word for red? Not ivory. Aubrey? Auburn, Auburn, um, that's what Dolly says, um, locks of Auburn hair. And so, and she is just beautiful and she's so smart. And when she goes places, she really engages. That's a lot of like, okay, okay. But if yeah, I who said, cares? <laughs> my friend Heather is the kind of woman that Dolly Parton wrote Jolene about. When she walks in the room, everyone else becomes invisible. So every time I was with her, I felt like the luckiest dude on earth because all eyes were on us. Great. We know exactly who you are then. That kind of description now cuts out a lot of words that are like, oh, okay, she was beautiful. Like, beautiful how? No, I could just cut to how did yeah. the beauty make people feel? And that's all we need to know. Yeah. I mean, that's such a better way to say it, right? Because when you're just giving the details where you're describing someone, I mean, it's kind of boring. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I wasn't bored because it was about me. <laughs> But it was boring. It was boring. And it's not helpful in that instance. I'm not actually try. I don't care if they actually imagine you specifically. Right. I want them to understand the metaphorical version of you. Oh, she's the kind of person everyone could would look at. You know, uh, another way I saw someone describe this, someone put this from a book and I thought that's genius, is he looks like the kind of person um, that comfortably lived amongst rats in a sewer. Got it. Cool. I don't care if you imagine exactly what he looked like. I just want you to see that kind of guy. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Now you could keep yeah. going. That um, efficiency with words, like what you're doing with stand up, you're trying to get closer to the emotional truth. I would imagine in your stand up work, when I've worked with, with a stand up before, can we get closer to the emotional truth of what we're saying mm -hmm. so we don't have to describe all the physical stuff that isn't helpful? Yeah. All right. So we're talking about the good stuff. <laughs> what are, and I know you already said memorizing, but like, what are some of the biggest mistakes that mm. you see people make? And this is, this goes both like polls on this, right? Because there's the, sometimes when I say like writing a script word for word and memorizing is hurting you, people say, great. He just co-signed for me to wing it. And it's like, no, no, no. Winging <laughs> it is also not helpful because then you're always going to do that thing where you leave and you say, ah, could have been better. Ah, I don't think I got through. Well, right, because you're making it up every night or uh, you're making it up every time you get out there. And so in between, so memorizing it doesn't work. Writing it word for word and memorizing it word for word doesn't work because then on stage, what you're focused on is memorizing and thinking, wait, this is what I memorized. And we've seen this before. I think even together we've seen this before of like, oh, they forgot their lines and now they're frozen. And they'll say like potentially if they're in a rehearsal. What's my line? Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's because like, they've. It's your story. Like, it's where you are. In the, like, just talk. Yeah. But they've completely forgotten the mental journey they were on because they're just memorized the lines. And what yeah. happens that's different in acting when you're on stage with other actors, if that happens, Heather and I are in a scene together and I'm like, <laughs> she could say, you haven't even asked me about my hat. And it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, I was supposed to talk about the hat. But if I forget my line, she could help me. When you're up there as a speaker, you're on your own. Nobody knows what you're supposed to say. And by the way, the audience thinks it's your like original idea. So why are you stuck at what to say next? So memorizing it, writing it word for word and memorizing it word for word is dangerous for that reason. And also because most people are not trained 
actors. So now you're trying to deliver words you wrote and make it feel planned, but also spontaneous. Audience want that. Like I want it to be theatrical and planned, but also like I want it to feel spontaneous. And so, so it doesn't work for most people and we can see that and feel that. And then winging it is also difficult because unless you're really well-trained in storytelling, winging it is going to cause you to do a lot of backstory. It's going to cause you to like, oh, I should have left that part out because it would have been funnier when I said it in a minute. So winging it is not helpful either. So there's this middle place that I work with people to help them workshop their ideas, workshop the story. Where could it start? What's funny in it? What are we building towards? And then when I'm looking at a speech, I look at it and say, there are nine sequences essentially. So there's nine, three boxes, three boxes, three boxes. So you get like a tic-tac-toe thing. And act one is across act two, act three. And each of those boxes has a job to do. Now you're now if you're thinking of it that way, you're like, okay, yeah, I did that job. I can move on. I could go now tell this story. I know what story, I know what story does that job so that I could jump in there. So you workshop it and you rehearse it by going through those boxes and figuring out the stories, taping it, watching it, and saying, ah, if I hold back on the fact that my mother-in-law um drove a prius it might be funny when i point out the fact that you know i'm making this up in the moment that my father-in-law drove a tahoe you know whatever it is so it could be a funnier joke it could land better it could be more emotional and we don't know that if we wing it but if we memorize it word for word and we are stuck on the script then it often comes across not very honest either Mm mm-hmm I feel like when we're on stage, we have so much more control than we realize. We often think that the audience has control, right? And so unless we give it to them, we truly are in control. And um, it's so interesting. So, you know, even, you know, I speak and, and with comedy, when you see people who clearly forget what they're doing or they stumble (laughs) or um, they'll even say, well, that didn't go over well, or I guess I'll move on (laughs) from here, right? And it's like, no one knew that was supposed to be a punchline. Only you were expecting the joke. They don't necessarily know that you're supposed to laugh there. So you just keep it moving. I'm thinking there was a time where I forgot to put a joke in. And so in the moment, as I'm talking, I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't now redirect that. And that's so, I feel like it's part of being in the moment is being able to know I mean, I don't know if you would call that improv or just being confident that you're there to inform, you're there to entertain, but you are in control at all times. And the moment that you have a meltdown or let the audience know you're not in control, then you've definitely lost it. Yeah. And I think that's where then the workshopping has to take over. This is why the winging it is it completely work because it's like, oh, in a in a workshopping version of this, which is my version of like working on the material and then like rehearsing it, you would have figured out where the joke went and you would have built towards that. Now you may not have said the story exactly word for word, like you were workshopping it, but you knew, oh, to get the joke to work, I need to make sure I set it up this way. Cool. I'm, yeah. I got that. And so that's the job of that is to give you that, that little bundle that you're like, Ooh, I'm safe. And in the moment, if you didn't get it right, you'd be like, ah, I have to move on. Cause I got to let that one go or I got to reset it up now. And now I know how to do that because I've workshopped it so many times. And it's uh, this idea of write the speech down, memorize it, and then like rehearse it in front of the window at the Des Moines Marriott as you prepare for the night before. I think it's just costing a lot of people their power on stage and their sense of control, you know, Mm -hmm. and their sense of making choices in the moment. So whether we call it rehearsal or workshopping, practice, how important do you think that is to being able to give a good presentation or keynote? I think it's, I think it's the critical piece of it. Now, is there a range? Yes, because if part of workshopping it is that you don't know how to tell stories at all, then your workshop is your workshopping of your content's going to need to be more than mine. Like, I, in the moment, could probably think that, 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 okay, got it. I know where this story is going to go. I know where to start it. But if you haven't had 20-something plus years on stage, then you're going to need a little more time to know, how do I build to a surprising, funny moment? How do I ratchet up the stakes so they're emotional? So you have to count in both your workshopping time on the current thing that you're doing, 
like this actual story. And also your like residual workshopping time of like how much how much prowess do you have? How much do you know how to use your body on stage and make different choices with it? Well, if you've never thought about it before, we might want to workshop a little bit more. So you have more kind of built in when you get up there. But if you've been a performer on stage uh, using your physicality for 20 plus years, you may not need as much workshopping there. Um, but I think it's I think it's the number one thing. And I really don't think of it like rehearsal, because in rehearsal, what is often the case is you're kind of rehearsing a done thing. Like the job of rehearsal, even in like play development is it's done. You're just finding the emotional arcs and stuff, but like you ain't changing it. But when you're workshopping a play, like when they're workshopping Hamilton, say there's so there's songs from Hamilton. We don't know because yeah. when they workshopped it, they didn't work. They said, huh, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Maybe we need another scene where we understand why she's so upset. And so that part of workshopping isn't rehearsal because we don't have it memorized yet. The benefit to speakers with a workshopping process is by the time you're ready to get to Des Moines and stand in front of that mirror, you have said that opening story so many times and you've worked through it so many times that you know how you want it to go. And like Heather said, if something happens, you know how to fix it because you've done it a bunch of times, which is different than rehearsing. And then you get up there and something happens. You're like, I don't know any other way to tell this story <laughs> because I've only practiced it one way. <laughs> right. I don't know why that needed to be a song, but. I like it as a song. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I know what you mean by keynote directing because I've actually seen you do it, right? Like I, yeah. I've seen it in practice. But for those who are listening, who are speakers, who are like, I've actually never heard of keynote directing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is going to be like eye opening for them as a new tool, right? Like as a new opportunity to, to up level. So can you share with them like what that even is and what <laughs> they would expect if they had a keynote director. Yeah, I think we made it up. I don't think there's anyone else in the world who <laughs> uses it. Um, so it happened because my clients were introducing me to other people. And I work with the caliber of people who don't really want to say like, I have a public speaking coach. Like, and if you're if you're like a paid professional speaker, there's probably something in that of like, I don't want people to think the thing I'm supposed to be good at. I have a coach making me good at it. Although, I, you know, I think there's. Th Look, I know you're not a football game. guy, but like the best football players in the world have multiple coaches. Yes, yes. Performers do. And so it started there. And so people started using it. So I started using it. And then I thought, I actually do think I'm doing something different than public speaking coaching. So public speaking coaching is, it could be anything, right? It's like, I'm going to help you reduce your ums. I'm going to help you. And that often starts in this pedantic, like, let's count your ums. And it's like, well, how the heck that's going to help me be less nervous? Because the reason I have my ums is because I don't know where to go next. And now you're making me nervous counting my ums. So like, what? Uh, telling you like how to like, how to do a steeple with your hands to be believable. And, you know, all of these things like that, what should be on your slide? How many points? And what I, and they're focused very much on the speaker themselves. What I'm looking at as a director is from an audience's perspective, just like a film director would. They're looking at it from the audience's perspective. What is in the frame? What's in the frame of that lens? What do we need to put in the frame so the audience is, like, if we want you to be scared in this section, what needs to go on the frame in the frame? What does the lighting need to be doing? What do the voice of the performers need to be doing? So the director is thinking that. That's what I'm doing too. When I'm watching someone's speech, I'm looking at it from the audience's perspective and saying, is this boring? <laughs> is this making me ask questions of like, how the heck is she going to get out of this? Or, oh my gosh, what are the, what's going to happen next? Is it making me say, huh, I wonder why we do all those weird things we do in our quest to insert whatever they want. And so I'm looking at it from that perspective. And then I'm looking at what is in the frame. So what are the images that I see in there? What is the what is the performer doing in front of me? What is the speaker doing? And what's possible for them? So if I'm working with Heather, I know I have different possibilities than if I'm working with someone else. Like my client, Erin King, is very, she has like a high level of, um, she could do a lot of physical comedy. So I could push her to do things and move in ways that I wouldn't push someone else to do because it wouldn't work for them because it's not possible. So like my job isn't to say like, let me make Jennifer Lawrence, Viola Davis, my version is to say, Viola Davis is trying to pull off 
Michelle Obama, how do I make Viola, how do I help her do that? Yeah. Um, how do I help Jennifer Lawrence be more emotional here so the audience feels sad? What needs to be in that frame? And I just think that's very different than what most public speaking coaches would be looking at. Yeah. Um, and it's also why for me, like if you're somebody who's like, oh no, I only wanna talk about the seven habits of great workers. I don't wanna tell any stories. I'm not your guy. Cause I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, that's boring. And I could Google it. We need stories to bring it to life. We don't need more information. We need more meaning. We need more meaning. And let's be honest. I mean, that's a nice way of saying it. No one in the audience wants to hear you speak. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not just a matter of like you being their director or their coach. Like no one wants to hear that. And like no diss to like Toastmasters or anything like that. But <laughs> there, there's a difference between being able to just get up and give a speech, which anyone frankly can do and to actually be able to hold an audience, yeah. move an audience and be at the level where you are a professional speaker or you are such a, you know, captivating speaker that you can have more sales. You can attract more clients, right? Like you don't, I feel like, and we talked about this a little bit five years ago, but I feel like there are so many opportunities to truly be a professional speaker. And there are a lot of opportunities if you're just an entrepreneur or leader to improve your speaking and presentations to the level where it can make you a lot more money. Oh yeah. I, public speaking, uh, sharing your ideas, communicating with people is social, it's relational, it's communal. And the person who is able to confidently connect with us to help us understand things, we automatically trust that person more. We automatically want to follow that person more. We automatically believe more. Like little things I said to someone last week, I said, oh, if we can, this little bit that you do here, she's like, I think it's kind of, it's fun, but it's cheesy because it rhymes. And I was like, the funny thing is that audiences believe something if it rhymes. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. It sounds goofy, but we believe things are more true if they rhyme. Okay. We so definitely why remember them that? better. Yeah. 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 The audience rarely, when I work with uh, trial lawyers uh, and helping them with open close and then witness support, we want to be the first one to make the audience imagine a scene. Cause guess what? We don't like to change our mind. If you're the first one to make them imagine what happened and you do it in a way that they believe good luck to whoever's trying them to unbelieve what they saw because you described it. And so that same thing happens with leaders. If you're gonna get out there and you're trying to do an all hands meeting, and it's, I think this all the time, by the way, if you're an executive and you do all hands meetings and you do these 90 minute meetings and you've got a hundred employees, you are stealing from your company, stealing money. If you do not think about your presentation there, if you just show up and it's like, oh, it's a 90 minute all hands, we're just gonna do whatever. 90 minutes of a hundred people's productivity that is theft. That is theft. If you do not actually bring them together, if you don't actually help them see the vision, imagine what the world could look like, get excited about what's happening. If you don't take that opportunity to describe something that everyone is talking about being a frustration, if you don't name it and call it and set it up and help us understand it, then like shame on you. So as, as you said, public speaking skills are just communication skills. At the end of the day, the leaders, the salespeople, the, uh, the business owners who are better communicators, we automatically trust them more than we do other people. So why wouldn't you want to set yourself up that way? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's one of the biggest underrated skills for leaders and entrepreneurs, frankly. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness. See, look, we're already at time, but I could go on forever. <laughs> All right. So I know that you have um, an amazing download that everyone can grab for free StoryCraft. It is the five stories that every entrepreneur, is it just entrepreneurs or is it uh, like, would it qualify? Like if you're not an entrepreneur, like you're a leader or someone else, or is it entrepreneurs? No, it's, it's, I think it's a really great for salespeople, for leaders, for executives. Um, there are these five stories. It's essentially like who, who you are, we tell that in such a boring way usually. Uh, what What is this about? How do you go about doing it? Um, the unspoken thoughts in my head that you need to address. 
and uh, and then why this matters so much, why you care about it. And we typically approach those in such boring ways, but they are so fundamental to helping you. So even if you're a professional speaker, these are the kinds of things that should be on your website. These are the kinds of things that should be pinned on your Instagram posts. If you're an executive, these are the kinds of things you should get really good at talking about. So you talk about them all the time with your employees in a way that's engaging. If you're doing sales, if you're doing any leadership role, if you're an entrepreneur on your own, these are the five stories that you've got to be able to tell. And the prompts in there are really helpful to actually help you think of stories and not just like, well, I love to help people with speaking. No, like, let's go deeper and figure out, like, when was the moment? When was the, I call it the WTF moment where you looked around and you said, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, yeah. What was going on? Tell us that. So it's those five stories that we really should be able to tell uh, really in all of these different situations. Even if you're like a, a school educator, administrator. Yeah. Being able to do this is going to help you with your team, with your parents, with with whoever you need to communicate with. That's what I suspected. I, I've not read this particular download yet, but I'm going to download it. Um, and I thought, I know it says for entrepreneurs, but my guess is this actually works for anyone. So definitely <laughs> go and grab that. Um, go to mikeganino.com. We're going to put the exact links in the show notes and, but you can learn, you can grab that download. You can learn about his keynote directing. He occasionally does like retreats and workshops. He's actually got one if you're in New York. So this podcast comes out, I think it's June 11th. It, it, you start what? June 12th? <laughs> June 14th is a, I've June. got an event, June 14th and 15th in New York city. Okay. So look, I mean, you could go from anywhere, but if you're in like Philly, DC, New York, Boston, like that's super easy and you should go. Um, it's what, two days? Tell us about that, Mike. Sorry, I know like we're just like, it's going to be like right on us, but <laughs> if someone hears this and gets to go, how awesome would that be? Yes. And if they use, uh, if you go to the, um, if you go to my website or wherever and you go to the sales page, Heather has a link to get you 800 bucks off too. So like last minute and you get a deal. It's two days. It's all around these topics, storytelling, presentation skills, how we show up, our physicality that we bring with us to it, how we could be funny or serious, how to really show up and, and be influential, whether you're on a big stage, whether you're in front of a boardroom, whatever the case is. I've also got three stellar guest mentors coming who are talking about some of the business side of things. So Marisa Corcoran is coming talking about how to write copy that doesn't bore people. So how do you actually write copy that people want to read in your sales copy about page social? If you're an entrepreneur, a speaker, your social media is a distribution channel for your intellectual property. You really have to be thinking of it that way. Uh, so she'll be coming helping with that. Laura Gassner Odding, one of the like uh, biggest public speakers out there, is going to come and she's going to do some laser coaching with people on exactly how to like how to really own and go towards what you want, how to get clearer with it. And Erica Reitman is going to be there, and she's going to be talking about how to be a category of one. So you actually are standing out in this sea of like sought after speakers and. Uh, inspirational founders, she'll help you actually nail, how do you do that? How do you stand out in these very specific ways? So I'm excited to have them. It includes breakfast, lunch, and a VIP. Everyone is a VIP after party on Saturday night at one of my favorite little wine bars in Soho. So come, it'll be Love fun. It. I bet there's someone listening who totally needs to be there. So if that's you, this is your sign, sign up. And the code is Heather made me do it. So when you go to sign up, We'll put this in the show notes. But when you go to sign up on Mike's site, the the coupon code, the discount code is Heather made me do it. <laughs> and literally, yeah. that, yours is, your, I think yours is the only one that is written that way, by the way, because it just seemed like such a perfect <laughs> Heather. Like, that's exactly what Heather would do. That's, the, that's how I would introduce you. Let's go back to the beginning. Heather's the kind of person that uh, when all your friends say, why did you do that wild thing? You say, Heather made me do it. This Everyone would know exactly what kind of friend you are. <laughs> this is true. All right. Go check out Mike's stuff. And if you miss this retreat or what are you calling it? Are you calling it a retreat? This one is called the Mike Drop Arrow Retreat. Yes. Um, okay. More but there are coming. Might be more coming up. I mean, you've done them in the past. So definitely check it out. Go follow Mike. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. And um, of course, we'll we'll chat soon. <laughs> See you in five years. <laughs> yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me for this week's podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, 
Give the episode a like and leave a comment below so we can keep the conversation going. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss a future episode or announcement. Listening on Apple, Spotify, or another podcast app? You can watch the video and join in the after show conversation by visiting hustleandflowpodcast.com.